Okay, our uh, next presenter today is Glenn Lockwood. Uh, Glenn Lockwood is a storage architect at the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, where he leads future storage systems design, IO performance engineering, and many storage R&D activities across the center. He was the lead designer of the 35 petabyte all NVMe Lustre file system and is a contributor to the IOR and MD test IO benchmarks and the Darshan IO profiling library. And today he will be speaking about understanding and measuring IO performance. Thanks, Rick. Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending my tutorial. This tutorial is uh, the title is just a very fancy way of saying uh, an introduction to parallel IO benchmarking. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. Um, even though this is the Luster user group meeting, nothing I'm going to say here is particularly specific to Luster. And so although I'll have a bunch of examples that demonstrate specific peculiarities of Luster, and I'll use Luster as an example heavily throughout, everything that I'm presenting actually applies more generally to all parallel storage systems. And so in addition to that, I'm also only able to cover the very basics of parallel IO benchmarking. It is a, a an engineering trade as well as kind of an art form. And there, there is a bit of subjectivity to it. I'm going to try to outline just some general best practices. And uh, if any of you who are very experienced in this area who are attending want to disagree with me, please feel free to, to throw tomatoes because uh, there is no one right way to do IO benchmarking. Uh, in addition to only covering the basics, uh, I'm really only going to be able to touch on two to maybe three areas of performance analysis on parallel storage. So I'll definitely be talking about how uh, to effectively benchmark bandwidth on large parallel file systems. We'll talk a little bit about ways to measure IOPS, which is relatively new to parallel file systems uh, as far as being able to deliver IOPS numbers that are not embarrassingly horrible. And uh, we'll touch on a little bit of metadata benchmarking as well, if time permits. All right, so before I get into the nuts and bolts of the tools of the trade and, and what the command line options are and things like that, it's important to set the stage for how to approach benchmarking from a philosophical standpoint. And really the very first step of any benchmarking effort is to first decide what are you actually trying to achieve by benchmarking? And I like to think of the answer to that question as falling into one of two uh, complementary spheres of thinking. The first of which is perhaps you just want a really big number. You want to get that hero number, uh, and that might be useful for a press release. Your center leadership might be asking, what did we get for this uh, giant pile of money we spent on this file system, or perhaps you need a, a big number to set for your acceptance criteria when you purchase this from, from a vendor. On the other side, uh, you might also want to, want to be measuring performance to effectively set the expectations of, of your users. And so you want to be able to tell them in user documentation and training material what they can expect if they do everything right. And these are very different forms of IO benchmarking. And I, I like to call them system performance benchmarking and application performance benchmarking, where system performance benchmarking involves measuring the capability of the backend servers and the infrastructure of the file system itself. And application performance is more about measuring what an application can reasonably achieve uh, and deliver to the end users of the storage system. And so to decide how you approach benchmarking once you've figured out if you want to measure system performance or application performance, uh, this is a very simple flowchart that, that guides you through that decision-making process. And so if, if you decide that you want to measure system performance, what you really want to do is measure the biggest number possible by any means necessary. This might be doing things that no user will ever do in reality, but it's all designed to absolutely max out whatever you've got on the backend side of your file system. And this means tuning um, all sorts of parameters to really balance the, the concurrency you can achieve to get the maximum performance without doing too much concurrency and starting to overwhelm the network or the servers on the backend. On the other hand, if you're measuring application performance, you don't wanna get the biggest possible number uh, 
by any means necessary. You want to subject your benchmarking to the constraints of reality and not use any kind of wacky features or tunings that no reasonable user would ever do. And so this involves carefully selecting your IO sizes and the IO patterns and the client counts to match what your users will actually be doing in practice. Once you've figured out uh, what you're trying to benchmark, uh, the next step in the process is how you will actually benchmark. And this is the bulk of what I'll be talking about in this tutorial, and specifically talking about the, the standard tools and the, the options that you should consider to get that, that result that you're looking for. After you get a really big number, uh, you then have to figure out what exactly did you measure and was the number that you achieved realistic given the constraints of what you know the system should be capable of delivering. And then finally, you also have to quantify the uncertainty. So we all know IO performance tends to be very variable. And so you never ever want to run a benchmark just once and take that number as gospel as being the performance of the file system. Uh, a rule of thumb that I like to follow is I always run every test at least five times to get you at least some semblance of a distribution. But generally speaking, the more you can run the same test under different scenarios, different times of day, different background workloads, the better off you are in capturing a, a more holistic view of what that file system's performance really is. And so I'll race through just the basic building blocks of Lustre and, and really every other parallel file system just so we're all on the same page. And so um, you, when you're on a client and you're running an application or your user's doing that, they see a, a big file, whereas Linux and the Lustre client driver itself sees that file broken up into what we'll call chunks here. And then those chunks on the server side are distributed across multiple servers. And this governs, this, this is what gives you the parallel performance that Lustre is known for. And the reason I say this is because uh, you should always, when benchmarking, do a general gut check and make sure that the numbers that you're getting aren't exceeding the speed of light, because the speed of light always applies when you're benchmarking file systems. And so, for example, one compute node that, say, has a 200 gigabit uh, NIC in it cannot saturate a file system composed of hundreds of OSSs, because you simply cannot drive that client uh, fast enough to match, say, every single server side's 200 gigabit NIC. And this is a great example of why a tool like DD, as much as system administrators love it, is not an appropriate way to test performance. You can test basic functionality of your file system once it's mounted with DD, but at the end of the day, tools like DD run on a single client, often with a single thread, and they will only get a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of what the parallel file system itself is capable of. Um, if you flip that around, um, if you forget to stripe your file, of course, the performance is going to be terrible no matter how many clients you use, because what you're doing is, even though a bunch of clients can inject a bunch of bandwidth into your network, if they're all targeting that, that one server that is holding the entire file because you forgot to stripe it, you're limited by the rate at which this one server can receive data or send it out. Perhaps a more subtle but still common case is when you have like a failover. And so if one server is failed over, the, the failover partner of it is doing double duty. And as is the case in most parallel IO, um, things proceed at the pace of the slowest member. And so even though most of your clients and most of your servers might be running at, at a good healthy clip, your actual IO benchmark won't finish until this double duty server, which is delivering performance only half as fast as all of its, its peers, completes. And so you'll see significant performance loss in the case of, of failovers and the imbalance that results. And then finally, you can accidentally do weird things like misalign your stripes. And of course, this effectively causes imbalance on all but one of your servers. And so um, again, this is a common thing that's difficult to uh, catch after the fact. And so you wanna set up your benchmark to avoid this situation as much as you can. And so ideally you've got everything nicely aligned and load balanced so that every client is talking to one and only one server. And so everyone's spreading the load equally, but in reality, you often have way more clients than you have servers. And so what you still want to achieve is, is equal load across all those servers. So the same number of clients in casting to one server and have that just spread out evenly so that no one server is doing double duty or more than its peers. Now, with that all out of the way, let's talk about first benchmarking bandwidth. And the standard tool of, of the trade to do this is IOR. 
Uh, IOR itself is uh, an MPI, MPI application benchmark, and it stands for interleaved or random because really all it does is it writes and reads huge amounts of data in either an interleaved or random fashion from all of these MPI ranks. It's very simple in its concept. It only takes really three inputs, uh, which are called transfer size, which is the size of every individual IO that IOR will issue, a block size, which is the uh, contiguous uh, amount of data that a single MPI rank will issue those transfers to or from, and then segment count, which governs the overall number of times uh, those blocks get repeated throughout the file. And this is a, a pictorial depiction of how these input parameters govern the overall geometry of the file that, that IOR as a benchmark will be generating, reading or writing. And like I said, you specify either if you want to do an interleaved or random um, pattern to and from these files. And then the output of IOR is, is, pretty, is pretty simple. It just tells you what your bandwidth was when you ran this test of reading and generating files of this layout. Uh, and it can also tell you the IOPS if you run in, in random mode. One really nice thing about IOR is that in addition to doing just standard POSIX file IO, it has a pretty rich plugin interface in the back end. And so you can not only test file system performance using standard POSIX, but you can test the performance through various IO middlewares like MPIO, Parallel Net CDF, Parallel HDF5, and even some newer uh, emerging standards that are, are cropping up in HPC. Right, so, so when I get my hands on a new benchmark or really any application, the first thing I like to do is just kind of jump in and thrash around and run it using the bare minimum parameters and hope it just does something sensible and then figure out from there, uh, you know, how to tune things and tweak things. So, so that's what we're showing here. Um, this is a benchmark, a real benchmark that I ran on, on a small Lustre file system we have in-house at NERSC. It's 120 gigabyte per second for uh, OST, all NVMe file system. And I had four compute nodes with 200 gig NICs in them to run this test. And so I ran IOR using, like I said, the bare minimum input parameters. I specify the transfer size, which is telling IOR to write and read IOs in one megabyte increments a block size of 64 megs, which means every MPI rank should write 64 megs of contigu contiguous data in these one megabyte transfers before skipping ahead to the next segment. And then I specify 64 segments just to make it so that IOR writes a substantial amount of data when it's running this test. And this should just work, but when we run it on this file system, the performance makes absolutely no sense at all. And so what we see is the write performance is abysmal. It's less than a 10th of what the file system should be capable of. And somehow the read performance is out of this world. It's actually faster than light, which is what, why I mentioned that you should always gut check your results. It's uh, about four times faster than what the file system should actually be capable of. And so what's going on here, if you do an LS while this IOR test is running, you'll see that it's actually writing all of that data to a single shared file from all of 64 MPI processes. And that's going to trigger all sorts of uh, issues around lock contention and, and things like that. And in this case, we want to measure system performance, not application performance. We want to see how close to that theoretical peak we can run our file system. And so the very first thing we do is add this minus uppercase F option. And this switches IOR from writing to a single shared file to one file per MPI process. And this eliminates all the lock contention across all of your compute nodes because every single MPI process has its own little play area and its own file that it never has to share with anyone. And so when we specify this minus F to our identical command line we used before, suddenly the write performance goes from nine gigabytes to sec a second to 70 gigabytes per second. So we're getting awfully close to what a reasonable expectation would be given our file systems 120 gigs a second. Uh, of course, that doesn't do anything for our read performance. It's still faster than light and it's, uh, it's about four times faster than light. So, so something else is going on here. Now, many of you may already have an idea of what's going on here, and, and indeed, it is the effect of page cache. And so for those who are not intimately familiar with, with how Linux handles uh, file I.O., 
page cache is this thing that lives on every single Linux, uh, and, and in fact, every single compute node of any operating system that I'm aware of. And what it does is it takes all the memory on your node that's not used by any application and just uses it to store the contents of files that have been recently accessed. And so it's intended to be a performance booster for just general workloads. Um, and, but as a result, it can dramatically affect the IO performance that you measure using benchmark tools if you're not careful about it. In the context of writes, what this means is that every time an application like IOR issues one of those one megabyte writes, it first lands in the local memory of the compute node, and then it returns right back to IOR to continue that writing process. And then off to the side, asynchronously, Linux itself will reorder and coalesce all those writes into larger RPCs and then send those over the wire as it can. And so for those of you familiar with Lustre client tuning, these are the parameters that govern uh, how much data can pile up in each compute node's local cache before it goes over the wire and how big those network transfers can, can accumulate up to before they're sent over the wire to individual OSSs and MDSs. On the read side, um, every time you issue a read from an application, it first checks to see if the, the data that you're trying to read from a file exists in the local page cache. And so what's happening if you do a write and then immediately read back those files as we did in the previous example, is those writes are first landing in compute node memory. And then as soon as, and, and they do get flushed back out to the file system, but there's still copies in compute node memory. And so when IOR hits that read phase, it never actually goes out to Lustre because it sees that, oh, the contents of that file that I just wrote are still in memory, I'll just read back from memory. And so that's exactly what's happening. And what this, this diagram here shows is uh, if you resolve the right performance of a sustained write workload, you can see for the first uh, bit of the benchmark run, uh, you're actually able to run really, really fast because this is when the compute node is actually just filling up its local page cache. And it's only when page cache overflows does it Luster start sending network requests over. And then the actual measured IO performance reaches uh, the server side hardware limit, which is this orange line here. Right, and so so on the read case, there's there's actually a really simple IOR option to work around this read caching effect, and it's minus uppercase C. And what this does is it, it's called rank shifting, and and all it does is it uh, it shifts all of the MPI ranks that read over by one compute node relative to the MPI ranks that wrote. And so if node zero wrote to a file containing block zero through three with rank shifting enabled, node one is the one who reads those back. And because each node has its own local page cache, uh, this node one doesn't have the contents of, of these blocks because they're still living on node zero. And so this is a really simple way to bypass all of the page cache effects on the read side. And indeed, when we add that minus C flag here to IOR, we see the read performance go from faster than light over 400 gigabytes per second to something far more reasonable. It's just 30 gigabytes per second. Now that covers the effect of or the bypass of recache, but this number here still reflects some amount of the effect of writes first landing in compute on memory and then asynchronously being sent off over the wire. And so we can work around this by adding yet another parameter to the IOR command line, which is minus E. And what this does is it forces an F-sync to be included in the time it takes to run the right phase of the benchmark. And so without this flag by default, IOR will issue a whole bunch of writes. And then the second that last write returns, it stops the clock, calculates what the effective bandwidth was based on that, and gives you the number. And then what's happening behind the scenes is IO is still actually happening because really that last write only landed in local memory. It was not included, it was not flushed all the way out to the server side. And so what you see if you don't include an F-sync in the write phase benchmark with this minus E flag is you might see a close operation at the end of the benchmark take a really long time. And you might think, oh, I've got something wrong with my metadata server. When in fact, what's really happening is the second you hit this close, all that data that had piled up in compute node memory in the page cache is getting flushed back when you close the file. And so you can just get all sorts of weird effects like this if you don't use and don't include the F-sync during your write benchmarking. 
And again, adding this uh, in this case has, has little effect on the results. But if you're running a hard drive based luster, you might see, or a, a clients with a bunch of co compute node memory, you might see this number suddenly go from a really high value to a much more reasonable value because it's including the cost of syncing all the data out to the servers uh, in your right phase time. And so pictorially, this is the default behavior of IOR. Like I said, the second that last write returns, um, the timer is stopped and you're really only including the time it takes to write really to uh, compute node memory. Whereas if you add this minus E F-sync flag, you're putting an F-sync at the end of each of these write phases and then stopping the timer. And then the closes are actually really quick because there's no more data that has to be flushed back to the file system because you did that during this F-sync phase. And so the reason I went through this example is just to show that you can't really dive into parallel IO benchmarking without at least understanding kind of the basics of what's going on. So just by adding these three little parameters, F, C, and E, we went from really poor write performance and really awesome read performance to something that's within our expectation based on our knowledge of the underlying file system. And this represented over a hundred times difference in, in performance just by fiddling with these three parameters. Of course, everything that you know about luster tuning also applies. And so you always wanna stripe your files to achieve the best overall performance. And whether or not you choose to do file per process versus shared file is really a decision of what are you trying to measure? Are you trying to measure system side performance or application performance? And that will govern what you do. For system benchmarking, which will be the focus of the remainder of this presentation, um, it's generally good practice to always include these three arguments, because if you don't, you will get weird cache effects appearing at strange times, and it will be much more difficult to figure out what the actual performance of your file system servers is. Right, and so I wanted to show some real life examples of, of acceptance tests that we've done at NERSC on our file systems to demonstrate that everything that I showed you is actually really the most of what you need to do this in practice if you do need to run your own acceptance tests or you wanna benchmark your own file systems. And so this is the acceptance test, the exact IOR line that we ran on our community file system at NERSC. This is a spectrum scale, not a luster file system. So you can throw your tomatoes and boo if you want now. Um, but I, I, I wanted to show this because it really is as simple as running IOR with our three magic commands to work around cache effects and then specify our block size and our transfer size. And this governs the geometry of the files that we're going to be manipulating. And that's it. And, and there's really nothing else. And this was criteria sufficient to um, decide that the performance requirements for this multi-million dollar file system were being met. And, uh, and that's it. It doesn't have to be super complicated. For our Cori Luster file system at NERSC, which is a much, well, it's, a, it's an older, but um, much more capable file system, Luster based, hard drive based, uh, 30 petabytes. We did the acceptance testing benchmarks in two phases. We did a write only phase and a read only phase rather than do writes and reads within the same IOR run. But again, the standard cache avoidance uh, arguments are still there. There is a minus G flag that will appear throughout many of these examples. This is actually less necessary nowadays when you're running IOR. It's just another good measure. Um, it, what it does is it, it puts barriers at the end of every single phase of the benchmark step, uh, of the benchmarking steps. And the reason I say it's less necessary now is because there's a bunch of implicit barriers that have worked their way into the way IOR uh, does reductions to calculate performance. And so you may find that this really has no effect on the performance that you see, but it doesn't hurt to include minus G in every test you run. And it just makes absolutely sure that you're, you've got your barriers at the ends of your reads and write phases. Again, we're specifying standard uh, IO geometry here. So we're doing four megabyte writes and reads. Um, and then to make a write only test, we specify minus W pretty obvious, just tell it to do the right test. And we specify minus K to make sure to tell IOR don't clean up after yourself. When you write a whole bunch of data, 
keep those files on the file system. And that's what allows us to run this read only phase. It will know to look for the files generated by this write phase. Without minus K, IWAR will delete all the data that it creates when it's done and clean up after itself. The reason we did this in two separate phases is kind of a belt and suspenders approach. At NERSC, the way we have our Slurm configured, every time we run an MPI job through SRUN, there's an implicit uh, dropping of all of the page caches on all the compute nodes. And so we did this so that by the time we run this read phase, uh, we're guaranteed to clear all the caches and all of our compute nodes, and we are truly not reading anything from node local page cache. That's redundant with these parameters up here, but again, it doesn't hurt. It's really a belt and suspenders uh, technique. Right, and so it really is a matter of, of adding that minus F, minus C, minus E to work around most of the page cache effects and specifying the job geometry, the, the block size, transfer size, and segment count. Now, a fair question to ask is, well, how much data should my test run? Should it, what should my block size be and what should my segment count be? And uh, you're really trying to balance two competing effects. And so generally you want to, to make uh, your block size and your segment count uh, big so that you're writing a ton of data and you're overrunning any caching effects that perhaps exist on the server side. Uh, but if you write too much data, you actually wind up risking just on a statistical basis of encountering some hiccup somewhere in your network or in one of your servers, which might introduce a bubble into your parallel IO. And this is not uncommon. And what you'll see when this happens is you'll get um, almost all of your MPI processes they finish really fast and, and post an effective, uh, effectively high bandwidth, but because one rank is slow because it had to pause for some reason, uh, the entire benchmark timer still runs out while most of the benchmark, the IOR processes are sitting idle. And so really you wanna go as big as you can before you start running into all these weird bubble effects. And so my rule of thumb, I like to run for between 30 and 60 seconds. That's just me. Uh, you have to decide for yourself what seems right. But if you run for too short, you wind up getting all sorts of weird, uh, like cache warm up effects and all sorts of weird things. And so 30 is, is really my minimum here. But again, you know, your decision of how long to run is really a reflection of what you want to measure and what your purpose in benchmarking is. And so consider that uh, when you're designing your benchmarking experimental process. Right, and so there is another way, which is relatively new to IOR to work around this effect of, of bubbles forming. And so by default, um, like I said, IOR will write the same amount of data uh, from every single MPI process. And then the timer stops when the last process, the slowest process finishes writing all of its data. What you can do is use what's called stonewalling which is uh, specified with minus uppercase D and you follow it by a number, which is the number of seconds. It's calling the stonewalling uh, deadline, the stonewalling timer. And what this tells IOR to do is after these 30 seconds in this example, stop everything. It doesn't matter that ranks may not have finished writing their data, just stop everything, stop the benchmark timer, add up all the bytes that had been written prior to that 30 seconds and use that to calculate your bandwidth. Now. Again, be very deliberate when you're using this and, and make sure that you realize this is not what applications do. And so the number you get while doing IOR with stonewalling tests does not reflect the real, reality of applications because apps don't just give up on IO if things are going too slowly and just you know say, well, I guess I don't need to write that data because it's taking too long. Apps will always wait for all their data to be written. And so again, this is really a parameter you only use when you're measuring system side performance, but because it does uh, let you specify how long you want to run your benchmark for, this has become kind of a standard way of doing acceptance testing of a file system, uh, which I'll show in the next slide. And so this is the exact uh, IOR line that we use during acceptance testing of our Perlmutter file system at NERSC. This is a 36 petabyte all NVMe file system that we stood up last year. Um, again, you know, standard MPI run arguments, we run it across a whole bunch of clients. Standard cache avoidance, that minus G is still here. We specify, you know, we're going to write one megabyte at a time. Uh, one megabyte blocks, but we specify an 
a, a ridiculously large number of segments. And if you do the math here, what this job geometry is, is doing is saying, right, half a, ter half a petabyte of data in this IOR run. That would take, a, this is a fast file system, but it still takes a long time to write a half a petabyte of data. And so what we do in addition is add the stonewalling timer for 45 seconds. And so if you take all of these arguments together, what it's really saying is write either half a petabyte of data or write for 45 seconds and take whatever that bandwidth was up to that 45 seconds and use it instead of the full half petabyte. And again, we, we ran this as a write only benchmark. Now the read side of doing a stonewalling benchmark gets a little gnarly because it's very easy to accidentally hit the end of file when you're reading back in data that was truncated due to the stonewalling timer. And so this is the way that we did acceptance testing again on our 36 petabyte NVMe Lustre file system. Um, this is all the same as what I've shown before. Uh, we do on the right phase, we do a 90 second stonewalling timer. So run writes for, for at least 90 seconds. And then we add this magical parameter here, stonewalling wear out. And what this does is it tells IOR to stop the timer at the stonewalling limit at that 90 seconds, calculate the no amount of data that the fastest MPI process wrote, and then let everything else catch up so that by the end of the run, every single MPI process has still written the same amount of data. And that data is equal to how much data the fastest rank wrote. And so you still are putting a time limit on your run but it's not exactly 90 seconds, it's 90 seconds plus the time it takes for all those slower processes to catch up. And the reason we do this is so that by the time we, we finish this write test, we have a whole bunch of big files that this write test ran, but they're all the same exact size, which means we can run a read test against those files without one rank, which might be a little faster than others, hitting the end of file. And so what we do here is uh, run a standard read test, but we only specify a 30 second stonewall versus a 90 second because we, again, don't wanna hit end of file. We wanna read in 30 seconds what it took 90 seconds to write and then specify this is a read only test. Right, so that covers everything that I wanted to say about bandwidth. Let me flip over to the Q and A window here. Uh, I don't see any comments. And so I will keep on flying. Right. And so the next thing I want to talk about is how we measure IOPS. And as I alluded to earlier on, IOPS is a relatively new dimension of performance to parallel file systems, mostly because IOPS have historically been awful for parallel file systems. And it's not just a luster thing, it's for every parallel file system because you know, back when parallel file systems were created, they were designed to deliver high bandwidth, not high IOPS. Um, but this has changed with the emergence of AI workloads and all sorts of non-traditional HPC workloads that do all sorts of uh, dirty IO patterns and not, not nice and sequential ones. And so file systems have, have updated to keep pace with this. And now IOPS is often a very valuable thing to measure in addition to bandwidth. Um, what an IOP really signifies in this case is, is kind of how long it takes or how quickly it, you can move the smallest unit of data to an arbitrary location on the file system or on the storage system. And so in Linux, the smallest unit of data is typically a four kilobyte memory page. And so that's what we will use as I'll talk about more in a second. And so one IOP is, uh, effectively modeled by the uh, time it takes to issue a four kilobyte read or write to a random position within a file. And um, you'll often see IOPS quoted in SSD or um, not so much hard drives, but SSD spec sheets. And really what this is signifying is different than a file system IOP because what it's doing is this is a reflection of how long it takes to move a four kilobyte page to a random offset within a block file device, not a file system. And so don't expect to see numbers like this coming out of your parallel file system. Right, and so like I said, IOR stands for interleaved or random. 
Interleaved is what you use to measure bandwidth and you don't have to specify any special parameters to run in interleaved mode, that's the default. But to run in random mode, you specify the minus Z flag. And what that does is it, it still uses the block size and the segment count to govern the overall size of the files you want to test with. But instead of doing nice sequential interleaved IO where say rank one is doing a, a, block, a sequential block of writes here and here, it just scrambles all of the offsets. And so it's still operating on a file of the same size and it is a, a, a deterministic pattern. And so it's not like one part of the file will ever be reread multiple times. You're still reading those transfer size increments. It's just the order in which they're read is, is completely scrambled. And so there's no notion of a block anymore or a segment for that matter. These parameters just govern the overall size in which you're going to be randomly reading and writing. And like I said, it's common practice to specify a 4K transfer size so that you're doing those four kilobyte page sized uh, random reads and writes in a file or multiple files. Everything that I've said about bandwidth testing with IOR still applies to IOPS testing with IOR. And so you still have to decide, are you measuring file per process or shared file IO? Uh, just be aware that lock contention becomes a much more significant factor when you're doing random uh, reads and writes to a shared file. And so your decision of use, using file per process or not is really a reflection of what are you trying to measure? Something that approximates application expectations or the backend system performance itself. Um, we still have to worry about page cache, just as we did with bandwidth. For reads, this is really easy. You just use that minus C flag, just as we did before to do that uh, rank shifting, and IOR will do the right thing. It will write randomly using one set of, of nodes, and then the its neighbors will be the ones to read those random offsets. Writes, unfortunately, are much harder to uh, avoid page cache with when you're testing random Right. Uh, this is because Lustre will do everything it can to cache all those random writes into much larger RPCs before it sends them over the wire. And, and normally this is what you want to do. You don't want to send every tiny 4K uh, operation over the wire if you don't have to. And so uh, we'll talk about some techniques to work around this, but they're not pretty. Um, and then finally, one consideration that is unique to measuring IOPS that doesn't really apply to bandwidth is whether or not you're randomly writing to a file that is brand new versus randomly writing to a file that already exists. And there can be a significant overhead associated with updating random places within a file rather than just writing new data to a clean files at random places. And you know you can think about things like the RAID penalty for me, read, modify, write uh, impacting the effect of rewrite. And whether or not you want to measure the write or rewrite IOPS is again, a matter of what are you trying to measure and what is realistic for, for what you're trying to accomplish. Right, so I said, trying to work around page cache when you're measuring write IOPS is, is pretty tricky. The standard way that many people will say to do this is to use direct IO. And in IOR, you enable direct IO by just specifying this parameter on the command line, posix.odirect. And this forces all of your reads and writes to completely bypass your client local page cache and send everything over the wire as is. And what this plot is showing is again, measuring uh, IOPS performance using our standard cache avoidance techniques here, and then turning on uh, direct IO for writes. And you can see a precipitous drop in apparent IOPS for writes the second you turn on direct IO. Again, hopefully you're getting it at this point, which one of these is a true measure of performance is up to you and what you want to measure. Um, I will say that true random writes is not a very common application pattern. And so if you are trying to measure IOPS because you think it's relevant to an application, um, you know, think carefully about how random that application's IOs really are. Now, if there, there really is an application that does random writes, uh, think to yourself, does that application actually use direct IO or does it use page cache? And if it uses page cache, you're probably better off not using Odirect because page cache does actually 
significantly improve the apparent random write performance of applications. And it's a good thing when you're doing random IO. Right. And so uh, that said, um, we do measure IOPS for our all flash file systems now. Uh, this is an example of a hero IOPS run that we did on a, a small-ish parallel file system we had access to. It is not Luster, it is vast. So again, boo and throw tomatoes if you'd like. Um, but we did use Odirect to make sure that every single random write that IOR generated went over the wire as is and tickled a random part on the, the server side rather than letting things pile up in, in local page cache. And so again, with standard arguments, cache avoidance here, F, C, E, and G, 4K um, transfer size, arbitrarily large number of segments because we're using stonewalling to cut off the test at 45 seconds. This is a write-only test. We specify minus Z to switch IOR into random mode instead of interleaved mode. And then we use Odirect again to ensure that uh, our random writes aren't being reordered in local memory before going over the wire. They are going over the wire randomly. And this last parameter is, is a little quirk. You can ignore it for most intents and purposes. This is uh, something that you have to do if a file system does a lot of data reduction. And so if you have like a ZFS OBD with compression on, you might want to try this and just see what the effect is. It, it, it makes IOR generate random and compressible data. So that was the right test. That was pretty straightforward. Uh, the read case, when you're trying to measure read IOPS on a large parallel file system, uh, bypassing page cache is, is really gnarly. Uh, I don't wanna walk through every single bit of this, but this is about the most complicated sort of acceptance test that, that I've ever run. Uh, we ran it in three phases. And so this first phase is generating a large data set of even size using the stonewalling wear out. And this is to generate that data set that we will be randomly reading from when we actually run the random read IOPS test. The second step is again, like a belt and suspenders step. And what it does is it sequentially writes a ton of data for 45 seconds but it redirects the output to uh, files that are prefixed with tempfiles.dat instead of the default. And so we don't want to overwrite the data set that we created here, but we do want to write a bunch of new data to ensure that all of the caches throughout the entire data path are flushed out and we've, they're replaced with garbage data. And at the end of this run, this step two, notice we don't have a minus K. So we say, get rid of all the data you just wrote. We just did it to cleanse the palette. And then this third step is the one where we actually measure the random read performance. And so this will read the data set that we, ran, that we generated in this first step here. Randomly, we'll keep the data set. We don't wanna delete it because it took a long time to generate this. We had to resize the amount of data we randomly read from because we use stonewalling up here. And so we don't wanna run out the other, we don't wanna hit an EOF error. And so we shrink this test down to fit the files that were generated here. And again, we're doing a minus Z to do random reads. And uh, this, is, this is, again, this is a really complex example, um, but you know these slides will be available, I'm sure. And if you ever do have to do a random read test and you wanna measure system side performance, but you don't wanna deal with the effects of POSIX Odirect, this is a way to do it. Right, and so I only have about 15 minutes. And so instead of going into the gory details of metadata benchmarking, uh, the standard tool for that, by the way, is MDTest. I'm gonna have a five minute diatribe about why measuring metadata performance using MDTest is not a good idea and why measuring metadata performance is deceptively simple, but in practice, very, very difficult to do. And so MDTest it is actually a it ships with IOR, it's part of the same source tree. Uh, so that means it's an MPI application benchmark. And what it does is it, it performs a bunch of metadata operations on a configurable directory hierarchy. And so you tell it how many things you want to create and unlink and stat, uh, and then it just does that in a highly parallel fashion. And it tells you what the metadata operations per second of each of those operations is. And then uh, because it's built on the IOR source code, you can use a whole bunch of different uh, backends to do these tests. So you don't have to just do POSIX file opens and closes. You can do MPIO uh, or anything else that's supported by IOR. 
And so, uh, you know, naively running it, you specify a number of things that you want each MPI process for MD test to operate on. And what it tells you is uh, how quickly it can create and stat and destroy things where things are directories, as well as files. Uh, and then it expresses the output in uh, op metadata operations per second. And so this top number here reflects uh, 13,000 directory creates per second. That's what this is here. And so what MDTest actually does, and this is why it's not super useful, is it runs through uh, all these phases. So it will create a directory tree that it will populate with a bunch of files or directories. Um, it will, for each of the directories, it will create and stat and rename and unlink them. For each file, it'll create and optionally fill uh, that file with some data. It'll stat it, it'll read and close it and unlink it. But between each one of these steps is an MPI barrier. And so what it's really telling you is what is the performance of say a file, the file creates per second in the absence of anything else happening on the file system. So how fast can the file system create files and only create files and do absolutely nothing else? Um, the, this is arguably useful if you do a lot of giant file per process checkpoint restarts, in which case you may have a huge number of MPI processes all creating files at the exact same time. Um, but it doesn't tell you anything useful for a system that is, is just full of users doing different things. And so the numbers that you get out of MD test give you no indication of how fast a compile will be, how long it will take to untar something, how long it will take Python to open up a bunch of Python packages when you import them. It won't give you an indication of what the maximum load for a file system is before it completely tips over or how laggy it will feel. It will really just tell you generally what the relative difference in performance impact of each metadata operation isolation is. And so you will see if you run MD test that you might get 10 times more stats per second than you can get creates per second. And what that really just tells you is that a, running the stat command, like running LS is 10 times cheaper than creating a file using the touch command. And that's it. And, that, and that's, it's up to you to decide whether or not you think that's useful or not, but I would argue it is not. And so you can, try to like liken these these numbers to useful things that a file system um, you know might be relevant to your users or your use cases uh, but it's very imperfect you're really not getting anything terribly useful there md test does give you a bunch of options to only run a selection or a subset of these tests and so if you only want to run file tests and you don't care how many directories per second you can create, you specify, for example, the minus uppercase F flag, and that will run only these file tests and not the directory tests. And then you can also specify what phases you want to run. And so you can run stat only or create only or unlink only tests. And this is useful if you don't really care how fast you can stat something, you just wanna see how fast you can create things. Um, so I just said MD test is, is useless, uh, but it's not. I mean, I'm being hyperbolic here. And so we do use it for acceptance testing. And one thing that we did on, um, oh, this is, uh, this is just showing the absolute basic essentials of, of running an MD test acceptance test. This is a, a real acceptance test on, a, on a, a system, a Lustre file system without DNE. So you tell it to create 20 files directories per rank, and then you only run a subset of the tests. Right, and so if you have something like DNE phase one where different directories live on different MDTs, you can specify using minus D and separating using the at symbol multiple directories in which you want MD test to evenly spread all of its files and directories that it creates over. And so this is a good way to measure DNE phase one or remote directory performance. For phase two, you don't really have to do anything special. Um, you just make a striped directory here and then you point MD test at that directory and you just run it. And this is the accept, this is an acceptance test that we ran for DNA phase two on our Perlmutter file system. Um, you can also tell MD test to build arbitrarily complex directory trees. So by default, it just creates all those files in a single shared directory, but you can use the depth factor and the branching factor to, to shape that tree. And so these are some examples of, of increasing the depth factor. You can get much more uh, deep file trees and the files that get created are evenly spread across them. You can also specify a branching factor to uh, have multiple branches within each 
layer of depth created. And you can create pretty gnarly looking directory trees full of files uh, to test performance. There's a bunch of extra little parameters that, that can tweak the exact nature of the trees and the tests that you run. So leaf mode will only create files at the leaves of the tree. Um, you can, like I said before, have IOR write a small amount of data to every file it creates if you want to approximate something more realistic than creating empty files. Um, and you can also do the analog an analogous function to that minus uppercase F file per process that IOR has by creating a directory per process to avoid any directory locking issues when you run MD test. And so uh, these are some real uh, MD test runs that we ran on acceptance. We used MD test in, in our Perlmutter file system, among other things, to model the purge performance because purging our file system is very important to us. And so what we did was we first created a data set full of one megabyte files using a pretty complicated directory structure. And we only ran file creates, we didn't run anything else. And we told it to spread these files over to uh, remote directories. And then we ran a second MD test that ran only file unlinks here to delete all those files we just created. So we're deleting a large number of one megabyte files. And we do this to, to figure out you know, what our purge server can realistically expect the purge rate to be. Right, and so that, that was a very whirlwind tour of parallel IO benchmarking tools and the standard ones. Uh, if you took nothing away from this other than this slide, I will consider it a success. You should always make sure you understand what you're trying to measure and why you're benchmarking before you start and make sure that you understand what the number is giving you, what that number actually is telling you that's, a, that's of significance to either your management or your press release or your users and understand that those two stakeholder groups are not the same and do not care about the same things. And, and just follow good principles of, of experimental design and you'll be most of the way there. I cover not only IOR and MD tests, but there's a bunch of other benchmarks that are equally, if not better. Elbencho is a, a kind of like a replacement to IOR and MD test together, but it doesn't rely on MPI. It uses its own REST interface. And so this is really good for benchmarking file systems that run in environments that are not traditional HPC that may not have MPI running on them. Instead, you need Boost. MD Workbench is a really neat metadata a benchmark that more emulates the compilation of complex applications. And so it does a very messy incoherent metadata workload rather than doing this bulk synchronous, nothing but creates, nothing but stats and nothing but unlinks. And IO500 is actually comprised of IOR and MD test and, and some other tools. And this isn't really a benchmarking tool so much as it is a set of canned workload patterns that might be a, an easy on-ramp into parallel IO benchmarking if you don't even know where to start. And then finally, a bit of self-promotion here. Everything that I've presented in these slides, including those examples, are actually all derived from a bunch of notes that I took for my own purposes and just threw up on my personal website. And so, you know, have a look at these links if you want to revisit any of this. They're, they're written in prose. They're nothing fancy, but they, they cover general usage and, and my approach to uh, jumping in and thrashing around and figuring out what these benchmark tools do and, and what the parameters do. And with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, our colleagues over at Cray HPE. A, a lot of what I've presented here today is actually things that I've learned while doing acceptance testing and performance analysis with them on our file systems at NURSE. Uh, and thank you for your attention. Great, thank you, Glenn. Uh, looks like we have a few questions in chat here. Um, one of them uh, from Brian asked, can you speak to Stonewall wearout issues which, with shared files in Lustre? We have observed major rank disparities in IO500, which leverages this, causing shared file IOR tests to take enormous amounts of time to complete. Gosh, that's uh, that could be many things. Typically, when things take enormous amounts of time to complete, it's because one rank will grab a lock for um, a huge chunk of the file and will race ahead. And so when you do uh, stonewalling with wear out, that one rank is just going nuts and getting full performance 
the timer stops and then suddenly every single other rank which had been doing nothing that time has to catch up to that really fast rank. And so you definitely see this in random performance tests. I've seen it there, uh, but that, you know, not knowing more details, that's my guess of what's going on there. Okay. Um, Cameron asks, uh, if, have you found a standard of how many ranks per node optimizes bandwidth? I wish. Uh, I, I showed a couple different PPNs um, across the different file systems we tested, but it's, it's really a function of uh, your CPU capability on your compute nodes, how many compute nodes you have, and how many compute nodes it takes to overwhelm the Luster servers or the whatever file system servers you have in the back end. And so we balance that. It's frankly a lot of trial and error and, and standard scaling testing that we have to do. Uh, I had a question from Alex saying, do you take efforts to distribute files over different OSTs, uh, MDTs to avoid placing them on the same OST or MDT? Yeah, so that's, so at NERSC, we have a default stripe of just one uh, for a variety of reasons. And so when you run file per process, assuming you don't do anything goofy with the directory that you're running in, file per process will automatically spread those files across all of your OSTs or whatever OSTs are in the pool that you're in. And so you, you don't explicitly have to worry about that if you're just kind of doing the same thing. Um, for MDTs, again, it's a matter of, that's a bit more tricky because you have to structure you have to decide are using Stripe directories or remote directories with DNE. Um, at NERSC, we do not use Stripe directories by default. We use remote directories. Um, but again, we tend to place individual users on individual MDTs. And so it's unrealistic to run a test uh, to model user behavior striping across multiple MDTs because every user by default will only have their one MDT. Okay. Uh, I think that was all the questions uh, we had. So thank you, Glenn, for your time. That was a very informative presentation. Uh, the next tutorial will begin in about five minutes.